which will now have um, um, a solution session for another 10 or so minutes as we move on into this class. I know that uh, you have received the prior communication according to the calendar for the day that you'll be taking the electrical class today, but apparently the instructor for electrical is held up in some traffic jam somewhere in Lagos and so could not get to the center to handle to this class. So because of that, I've had to bring my uh, future class forward. The design commissioning class is the one I was supposed to hold uh, next week or thereabouts. So I'm going to be holding it today, which means that the electrical uh, instructor will have to take my slot um, when he's uh, able to make it to class under the schedule date. Okay. Uh, I know that an email has gone out with today's material, Design Build Commissioning class material. If you haven't checked your email, please check it and download it now and, and start reviewing as we do this flashback into the last class, okay? All right, um, having said that, uh, welcome again to class. I would like to see those who are in class, so please put on your videos so that we can have a robust discussion. I would like to start with Maritella. He's one of those that came into class first today. So let's hear from you on the takeaway from the last class you had. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my major takeaway from that uh, the four major components of an AC, which is the compressor, the condenser, the expansion valve, and the evaporator and also uh, learn how to maintain each one. And sometimes when your AC develops fault, you should know sometimes your technician might just tell you it's the compressor, you should go for a new compressor. But it's advisable to first check for the capacitor. If the capacitor is still good or not, then after that, then you can say, okay, you want to change your compressor. And so learns about the different pieces we have, which is we have your split unit, your ceiling unit, your fan coil, chiller, your VHF, and all that. So that was my major takeaway from that. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's hear from Adela here. Adela. Hi, good evening, everybody. Okay, good evening. so good evening. Um, there were many things to pick out from last week's class, Saturday's class, but I think one of the things was uh, the extent, the use of the expansion valve. And I've seen it in a different light compared to, so he, he said the reason why it is there is because it, um, it helps to reduce the pressure of the gas or the flow when it, is, when it comes out of the outlet into the expansion valve, it helps to bring the pressure down before it goes further. So yeah, it's it has helped. I've, I I guess because I used to see the he explained that there are two types: the um, valve itself, or sometimes you have just a tube that has a bulb I and mean, it has a bit of a bulk on the body. Mm -hmm. So I used to look at it and my mind, I'm like, what is? Why does it have that? Swear, like, can't you people just make things straight and smooth? But now, seeing that, like, okay, I have been made to understand there is a function, it's not useless. So, that was one of the things. Thank you. And also, the, the calculation of an um, AC for an area that you just don't put an AC because it is an AC, just you have to calculate the area. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And 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 you like you express it's it's sometimes a bit of a mystery to see that with all this size of an AC is that tiny expansion valve that does the entire cooling that changes the temperature of the gas from hot to cold. <laughs> so, so the compressor is just a motor. The compressor is just a motor. It's just a pump that forces it through that valve. So, and and that, that, valve, exactly. that valve, you know, compresses it and, and drops the temperature. You know, so. Sometimes you can see a big thing and a small thing doing all the magic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Alaya, well, let's hear from you.
You are still muted. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I was saying that um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So I was that, um, um, part of what I would have um, mentioned has been mentioned by some of my colleagues earlier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but what I could just also had was that um, um, the the different maintenance um, uh, requirement for each of those uh, components, the condenser, mm -hmm. everything, and also the um, the importance of um, uh, AC actually in terms of uh, regulating the indoor air quality, the level of uh, moisture that is um, allowable, mm -hmm. and then the, the difference between AC and the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Very good. So I can't about that too. And then, uh, though there is uh, some similarity, but still there are some quite a uh, difference in them. Very good. And um, also the reason why we might have leakages from the indoor units, that, mean, that, is, that is the uh, evaporator unit, and then the possible cost, which may be uh, that we had to have in um, um, the cooling air, cold air, um, mixing with, the, with warm, moist air from outside, mm -hmm. which may be condensing around the refrigerant pipe and then if we have problem with the drain pipe, uh, some of the problem I have here uh, already. So is is the kind of um, uh, enlightening me on some of the way to tackle those uh, issues because Very I wanted good. to ask on the batics before that. I've been having this problem though. We were trying to solve it in one way or the other. Mm. So, but uh, that gave me some um, a clue on some of the things that I also need to do, which I told uh, the service uh, provider to look out for and uh, which we are working on now presently. So okay. those are part of the things that are in mind. And then the capacity of um, uh, the chillers, and then the, the VRVs, uh, their energy efficiency, energy uh, ratio, uh, efficiency ratio of each of these um, equipment and how they are related. And also the types of refrigerants the the like of a uh, uh, four thing, and then the the now um, uh, what do I call it band uh, uh, twenty two or so the old R10. Yes, yes, R yes R twenty two yes R twenty two and then the the other types are this R thirty two that is a um, a better option to R um i mean i mean four one zero one zero okay so which Thank we you. can uh though the efficiency of the uh the band refrigerants are better but they are not friendly to the ozone so we have to be banned okay. and in favor of less uh, efficient but more environmentally friendly uh refrigerants so okay. these are part of my care. Thank you. That was, that was actually teaching the whole class again. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I would like to just stress a bit is that if you, since you know the component of an AC, you can now come up with maintenance scope activities for each component. So don't just say they are servicing my AC. You know, when we did the maintenance class, I said try as much as possible to get rid of that word servicing so that does not replace your maintenance scope. Your maintenance scope should be broken down. You know the four aspects of main components of uh, um, equipment. You know what needs to be done to each of those components so that you can continue to get um, um, long lasting results or efficiency from them. Okay. Daniel, take the mic, please. Okay. A very good evening, Tisa, and um, my fellow uh class members welcome okay um well, well i was not uh, actively involved in the last i was uh, in the last class because calls keep coming in to attend to some issues in the estate mm -hmm. okay uh well i learned so many things uh, from the last class and then um also, the classification of the ACs, that is the um, air conditioning system, just with the dotted and undotted. So that also was explained. So 
and uh, daughter also uh, and on daughter we also classify um, where we classify further down you know so I realized that um, on dot uh, splits AC uh, fell under uh, splitting it fell under uh, on dotted and then um, also the what we call the central um, plant. So he also this is where I learned uh, in detail or consigning the VRF, how it works. And um, actually I'm familiar with it because uh, I'm involved in one of the installation right now uh, because, because of the energy efficiency of the, uh, of the of, of this particular air conditioning unit. Uh, you can, the whole building, the five bedroom, you can use as low as one horsepower because it has multiple compressors. So it peaks according to requirement. The compressors peak according to uh, requirement, the cooling requirement. Sure. So um, that is uh, my takeaway from the last class. Okay, thank you so much. Who else is there? Let me see if you are here so you can speak. Isaac, are you in class? Emmanuel Ono, are you in class? Victor Janako, are you in class? Lamide Ajayi, are you in class? Ansema Tumekwe, are you in I'm class? A, I'm, in, I'm in class. If you're in class, show yourself now. Yeah. Sounds like you are not in class. <laughs> I am, sir. I hear those background noise. I said, this is not, not class. OK, let's say your takeaway is calm now. OK, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so, um, the, our, the last class, um, at least I've uh, learned the combination on how the compressors and uh, the compressors, the condensers, and uh, the AC, the split unit, the indoor unit, uh, at least how to make choice. Um, on how and how to make choice of each of them, and uh, how to uh, uh, think of servicing them because they involve they are of different different uh, processes to to service. Okay. So and uh, also. Manuel is frozen. Um, when he comes back, I probably will be able to give him another chance to speak. Um, who's there? Uh, Chin, are you in class? Sakiru, are you in class? Tracy, are you able to speak? David. Sorry, sorry. Um, I just got a call while okay. I was Why? in class. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm following the class, but I'm a little um, unstable right now. Okay. David speaking. Yes, I heard it. No problem. Okay. Yes, Emmanuel, go on. Okay. Um, so I was able to uh, learn how to uh, at least service ACs, how to come up a bill. Or, uh, how to dictate what could be the issues if it's the capacitor that is bad. Um, uh, if it has a certain behavior where you. Okay, I think we, we, we got you there, Emmanuel, very clearly. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, get on with the uh, solution session. Anybody with a general purpose issues, problem that needs solution in this class, this is the time. What have you encountered lately that you want us to deal with for you? By the way, we have, we have, um, I've asked um, the class administrator, um, Ms. Barakat to reach out to each of you 
we are scheduling visits to your locations. I know she has been trying to ask you whether you would be able to set it up as a voluntary uh, thing so that we can come. No, it's not voluntary. We are making it compulsory. We will visit every of your locations. Now, not everybody can come. Um, I and all any of the facilitators um, will, 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 will come. So Barakat is going to be reaching back to you to ask for a date where we can come. Um, and it's not going to be um, a crowd thing. It's going to be a few people. We're going to be announcing those dates in the platform from time to time. Um, we're hoping that for every outing, we should be able to get at least five people to come for that tour. And I'll try as much as possible to be available for as many tours as possible. All right. That's the new structure for the field trips um, in this class. So even if your office is a small office or it's a big mall or it's an airport or it's a big school or it's a big uh, residential estate or whatever the size of the facility is, there must be something we should be able to uh, take a look at and advise you on, even if it's just the environment. There are, there are so many residential estates that it's just from entering the gates we will deal with uh, building fabric and structure issues. We will deal with landscape and environmental issues. Uh, for some, it's health and safety focus. For some, there's going to be mechanical aspects. For some, it's going to be energy efficiency. So there must be something we can um, we can uh, provide um, a useful solution to you for uh, when we come to your site. So she's going to be scheduling it, um, calling you one by one, so that you can uh, you know give us a date if you prefer a saturday if you prefer a weekday if you prefer morning if you prefer evening don't worry just let us know the time you prefer we don't intend to spend more than one hour in any location that we visit in this season okay uh barakat are you there barakat i need audio confirmation that you 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 got that yes sir okay thank you very much all right so if there's no um problem to solve in this solution session we'll go straight into this class as i will share with you my screen i hope everyone has received the material to this uh, class design with commissioning all right let's hear from kinsley kinsley has something to pop up for us go ahead good evening everyone you're welcome. My issues has to do with um, what we taught last in the last class. I I did some um, research in my workplace, and I discovered that um, we have two package ACs that are giving serious issues. Mm -hmm. First of all, is um, it will come up to work five minutes and goes off. Mm -hmm. Now we've, um, we've done, we've changed capacitor, we've um, top gas, we've done deep servicing. We are still experiencing this issue. Now, after last week's class, I, I consulted a technician to come in again. And we'll do a check. And he said, uh, what we need to do now is to change the compressor. And for a three tons package unit AC, the bill he gave us was over 100 K. Yes. Of course, and that's for fairly yes. used compressor. That's not brand new. Fairly used, exactly. <laughs> fairly used. You to go to Brunoway and get a fairly used compressor. And then secondly, there's this. We have um, a split unit AC 1.5. Mm -hmm. Everything is working, but it's not cooling. It's dispensing water outside the way a normal AC it should be. You know, pouring water outside, but the cooling inside is not effective. Mm, okay. So I was like, uh, maybe because of this space. And um, then I recommended for additional 1.5 horsepower okay, AC. Okay, okay, okay. That maybe because the space is more. Yeah. That's why it's not effective. Yeah. So, so you know that, um, for, let's take the second question first. You know that he taught you how to calculate AC requirements. Yes. Exactly. So you can actually apply that. Uh, I'm sure that probably was making you feel the space is, is too big for the 1.5 horsepower. Um, so, so, so yeah, I, I at one time in my office, I had two, two one horsepower ACs, 
And then I now felt, let me take them off and put a single 1.5 horsepower to do um, the work. And then on very hot days, it's as if the ACs are switched off. The ACs are working very well, but you don't feel any cooling. Now, so, um, but then if you are alone, one or two persons in the room, it look as if that okay. AC is, is a superstar. Exactly, even in a hot day. So AC's uh, 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 workload, it depended on one, the size. And in terms of the size, we talk about volume, volume, not area. Because the AC is trying to cool a space, all right? So it's not just area, it's not length and breadth, but length and breadth and height, right? So you measure volume. And there's so much AC requirement for certain units of volume that you need to uh, uh, meet. So that's the first one. Secondly, is occupancy. So if I live alone in a three bedroom house, I'm going from one room to the other, right? Um, and I have ACs on everywhere. The ACs will barely do um, work because the ACs work really is to overcome heat, to change warm air to cold air, isn't it? And in doing that, you have to have warm air for the AC to change to cold air. And what causes warming of a space? Body heat, primarily, in addition to mechanical heat, you know, that's generated from lights and equipment and the rest. So you also need to consider how many people are in that location or use that space, right? You also need to consider the other mechanical equipment that are generating heat in that space, right? Now, on the people side, you need to also consider what kind of activity they are engaging in. If you have 40 people sitting down, for example, in a room and having a meeting, their heat generation capacity is less than even 10 people dancing to music in that room. Now, the AC requirement for five people who are actively dancing or working out will not even be comparable to 50 people sitting down quietly, right? So activity of the people is also very important. And then finally, this is also very important. Many of us overlook this, uh, building fabric and structure, uh, window insulation integrity, our doors and walls insulation integrity. If you have an air conditioner in a space, uh, the AC's work primarily is to keep that space temperature and air conditioned to the settings you require from, from it, right? But that setting or that expectation is very different from the reality outside. So outside could be hot, but you want to cool that space. But if you've provided connections through openings in windows or glasses that are too thin, not double glazed, uh, for example, or walls that you can feel the cooling from outside, what you are doing basically is trying to cool the garden. And there's no way the AC can be big enough to cool your garden. So sometimes your air conditioning capacity can be limited by what you have created as you know, access to the uh, cooling to the outside spaces. So sometimes I, I don't necessarily just add ACs. I will go and do some caulking and sealing and rubber lining checks. I'll go and do some window handles. If it's louvers, I'll probably change it to casements, you know, um, so that I can keep that insulation. I'll try that first. And now let me give you one big trick that many people have overlooked, your window blinds your window blind can save you from buying more ACs, right? Just recently in my house, I used to, I like white backgrounds. If you notice my home, my offices is white backgrounds. I even use cream colored or off-white blind window blinds and curtains and all that just to give that, that you know, lighting effect. But then I realized something, I would need more AC. You know why? Because there's a lot of heat ingress from lighted blinds and, and curtains. So I tried something in my house, in my own apartment. So I used some uh, golden silver blinds that were very thick and they, they kind of obscured the sun. So whenever I made the sun in, I'm not using AC, I open the windows and pat the curtains. But whenever I want to use AC, I drop those blinds and you, you won't believe how effective a one horsepower AC can be 
on such a large living room, right? So those are some of the things that we should look at. We shouldn't always be looking at the mechanical solution. Oh, go fix the AC, go fix the AC. Sometimes we should look at the building fabric as well so that we can deal with the other issues that will automatically make that AC automatically start working as a very super AC, okay? Right, sir. Yeah, the first question, uh, what was the first question again? This was the second one I was dealing with now. What was the first, first question? question was the package unit. Okay. So we need to change the replacement of compressor. Did the compressor get tested? Did he put, did he come with a compressor testing kit for checking that the compressor is functioning well or not? He came with a device. He said um, it's not, is uh, is weak. So that's why when he walks after 30 minutes, generates too much heat and because there's a sensor that is connected to it to pull the, the compressor it trip up so after 10 15 minutes it picks up again so that shows mm. that in the case that the compressor is weak so the light farm has um, well it's we've been using it for five six years now but i don't want to believe that it's weak mm -mm. So, 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 so what's happening there is that the compressor is being protected by, okay, from, uh, completely by damaged. from becoming damaged, right? So if the compressor is working and something is kind of impeding its effectiveness, making it to overwork itself or overheat, what happens is that there's a trigger within the system that tells the compressor to go down now. The fact that you are experiencing the, the compressor coming on and cooling for a while, is that what you're experiencing? And every now yes, and then sir. it goes up. Yes, sir. It should yes, tell sir. you that the compressor does not have a problem, right? So um, someone should uh, get a specialist to go there and look at yeah. it. You can call a Jiro, your teacher in this class to, to take a look at it. He can, he can advise. It could be a circuit issue. You know, it could be a, a, a circuit, board, circuit board issue. Um, uh, that's one one thing that uh, could be wrong when a sensor is given the wrong when the sensor goes faulty and starts giving the wrong reading. Okay, um, that could be an issue uh, because if the compressor cools at all, it means that it still has compression power. It means that it still pushes gas through the system, right? But after a while, it trips off. It means that there's a control in place to protect it from. Um, uh, blowing up. So I don't think you should listen to that technician that is telling you to change compressor, okay? All right, sir. Um, lastly, sir, um, I have a challenge. Yeah. We have close to about uh, 48 ACs, um, 10, 2 horsepower, and about uh, the rest, 1.5. Okay. We're running a 150 kVA generator. Mm -hmm. Now, what I notice is when we have 30 on, mm -hmm. you can get the optimal, it's working perfectly, the coolings are okay. But the moment you add more ACs to it, it reduces other areas that were cooling. The, the, the coolness reduce. Some of the ACs will start blowing just hot air. Could it be polarity issues? Like maybe the, the, the generator cannot power the, those amount of ACs any longer? My expectation is that my expectation is that if the generator is a good generator, when you overload it beyond its capacity, it should trip off. Right? It should trip off. The generator should trip off. I don't, I don't usually think that um, the devices, the load should be the one tripping off. Um, you know, what you're experiencing now is more like when you have 30 ACs, all compressors are all running. When you add the remaining 18 ACs, some of those ones that were running before, the compressors begin to drop off, right? Yeah. So they start blowing uh, fan. That might need some more engineering investigation. Um, have you done any uh, energy or load audits to say, um, you know, even if it's just to use a clamp meter, right? So to keep clamping and recording as you're adding more ACs to see how more load is being introduced to the gen. You know, from that, where the gen is, 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 is feeding out, you can keep recording the amperage that is that is being demanded of the generator as you add more uh, air conditioners. So you first of all need to establish whether the total load, as at the time all the ACs have, have been loaded, are more than 80% of the generator's rating. About 70. 
about 70 percent it's about 70 percent because I, I called the jmg technician mm. we got the generator from them they came we put on everything mm-hmm. and um, they were like well with what we have the generator should serve us the mm. load is about 70 percent we just mm. we just added two extra acs recently mm. that shouldn't shoot up up to 75 or 80. Okay. Okay. that means there's still space mm. Okay, then the next thing you need to do is to investigate the power quality issues that the gen is feeding out. You know, um, um, I noticed recently from a small generator, I just got this experience, the generators uh, start fluctuating in frequencies, right? So if the AVR or the uh, 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 frequency controller you have inside the gen is faulty, as the load increases, it starts you know, uh, vacillating between uh, sometimes 40 to 60 uh, uh, heads in frequency. And many air conditioners are sensitive to frequency changes. In my house, for example, out of the seven air conditioners, I have two that once the frequency is outside 49 to 52, they will go off, the compressor will drop off, it's a blowing fan, right? So um, I had to get someone to come and check the generator to find out uh, what frequencies we are running at different times. And many of them don't have tools for even checking the frequencies. So what I now did was to f- pass generator through an inverter. The inverter tells me what frequency um, it is receiving the power. So stabilizers or inverters or any other device that can help you know what frequency that is, you need to also uh, apply it there. And I think some uh, uh, clamp meters also have frequency reading where you can actually get to know what frequency that you're giving out of that. If you check and you find that the frequency is not stable as you are loading through and through, then you know where your problem is. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. You see what FM has done to me? I've become a master of all. Eh? <laughs> I'm talking electrical and generator with so much confidence. It's experience, but it, it's, it's when you open your mind to learn some of this technical stuff over the years as you experience them. And this is no longer theory, not like what somebody teaches you in a class. You, you actually learn them hands-on, but you have to be interested in them um, to be able to learn them and become really good at it like this, okay? I didn't do electrical engineering. That's why most of the time I bring other people to come and teach you in class, but there's hardly anything the instructors will teach that I have not experienced in the last 25 years. And um, besides, most of the content were created in, in, by me in the office as well. So basically, this is all about growing into every area of your profession as you grow, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sakiru, you have one. Have I seen your face today? I thought you didn't talk today because you don't want to be in class. Eh? <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Just a quick one, sir. There's this, there's this debate in our office that in order to observe COVID-19 protocol, they say we should open the window down for cross ventilation mm-hmm. at the same time to make the place cool, to get to gain better ambience. Mm-hmm. So we've been struggling with this proposal. What to do? What kind of what kind of cooling did you used to use before now? VRV. Central cooling. Central cooling. Um, does it have air intake, fresh air intake as part of the system? Yes. It has fresh air intake. Yes. Okay, so um, now that you have, you've shut this system down and you're opening windows, do you have fans? We don't have fans. We, 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 they even said we should, we are doing energy free day for those days. Mm. Energy free day means we, all the compressor will not kick in. Mm. Everything will remain static. So we want to even gain some, uh, some, some more power uh, so, to make some saving from it. Yes. So That's at good. the same time, one big guy will be at the corner claiming that it cannot concentrate everywhere is us. <laughs> what you have just brought is um, is a classic case of the uh, uh, the triple bottom line. Um, uh, feasibility, right? Uh, is there something you're doing for sustainability? Because the whole idea is very sustainable. Let's have energy free days. Let's have days where we use less power. Let's have days where we are minimalistic in our approach to consumption, right? 
On those days, we will dress down if possible, not wear suits and all that. On those days, we will not be uh, physically exerting in the ways we, we work. And that way we will minimize the impact on the environment. It's worthy. In fact, in fact, it is proven that the air outside is always better than the air inside. No matter how bad that air outside is, you know why? Some of the bad air outside is inside, plus all of the emissions that we bring from our bodies inside, plus all the furniture that are locked in. The air outside is moving, the air inside is not moving, right? It's just like moving water versus stagnant water. That's the difference between the outside air and the inside air. So if anybody tells you that, um, let's open the windows and use cross ventilation, it is actually a healthy practice. It's actually a healthy practice, okay? So there is the energy saving and then there's the health side to it. But then you have to balance that against productivity of the people that you put um, in those spaces. Because if you are getting all of those benefits and the work is not being done, we're just wasting everybody's time. So there must be a balance to that. So if you have someone who can't concentrate, maybe the heat is affecting him, don't, don't tease and say, oh, this one is Oibo or this one is doing this or that. It may be a medical situation for that person that the person needs to actually be cool to certain temperatures to be able to get the brain to work, right? And if that person's work is so important, I mean, for goodness sake, you have to either provide that cooling or, uh, or provide the person a separate uh, environment to work at. That is your job as a facility manager. You must create that balance all the time, okay? Thank you. All right. Okay, so we get into today's class, design, build, commissioning. Um, in today's class, we want to look at the development cycle. Um, many of us come into facility management and we are handed a facility to go and manage. So basically, we just go ahead and start managing the facility. The facility did not just come about um, overnight, uh, suddenly. It started somewhere. Somebody had a, 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 an idea, a concept, had a need to satisfy, and that facility was built. And then uh, we as facility managers were brought in to manage that facility, not just to manage the facility, but to make sure the facility provides the value or the intention of the, uh, meet the intention of the owners, investors, or um, developers. So we're going to look at that process of how um, we take over the building after it's designed and commission it and move it into facility management using the development life cycle of a building. The building starts at the planning stage. What happens at the planning stage is basically the conception of the building. The conception of the building. This is where the decision is made to build. And that is shown to, that is made to build or acquire, even if you're going to buy an already built one, will be based on a need you want to meet, a problem you want to solve, or an opportunity you want to take advantage of. Usually planning is done at the ownership level. So the owners are the ones that do planning. They usually will work with a facility manager because it's from the facility manager's work that they know that that space that they used to have is not enough, or they know the requirements for the new spaces that they need. So basically, the FM, property team, real estate team, the owners are the ones that work together at the planning stage. What is the input to the planning stage? The input is the vision, the mission, the concept, strategic objective of the owners. Those are the main inputs. What are the outputs? The main output is called a brief. A brief summarizes what the facility should be, the capacity of the facility, who it should serve, what value it should bring, and so on and so forth. Basically, encapsulating all of that information on, in the minds of the owners into a document that is handed over to the design team. What do designers do? The designers take on this brief, and when they take the brief, they try to translate words into two dimensions or three dimension representation, which is try to create it in a virtual way for persons or individuals who had the inputs into what they wanted to see what it may look like in reality. 
That's what the design team is trying to do. Okay, so they start the process by creating what we call a, a, a bubble diagram or a simple schematics, where they take the site, they map out certain flows within the sites, and then they create certain relationship between various groups of users of the facilities and form a flow. From that, they create single line drawings of spaces, may not be dimension. From there, they try to put some dimension to those spaces after they've accounted for all the space requirements from the brief, then they now go back and forth with the facility managers and the owner on the process of developing the finalized floor plans, what the elevation should look like, what the sections and other perspective views should look like. As they are, when they are done from the design stage, um, the design work is not finished until you've had uh, architectural drawings produced. Uh, mechanical and plumbing drawings produced, electrical drawings produced, structural drawings produced, depending on the on, on the on the kind of house or building you are you are trying to develop, and then the site drawings detailed. They use those drawings to get further work at the design stage to produce a bill of quantities. The bill of quantities is usually um, taking that you've taken the brief, you've turned into a, a dimension a drawing, that are two dimension in CAD or three dimension in Revit and, 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 and beam models, for example. And then someone extracts a bill of quantities. So basically it is these materials, this labor and this effort that will go into translating these drawings that we see on paper or this image that we see in the computer into a real building on the ground. So the bill of quantities is produced. And with the design drawings and the bills of quantities, you now put them together to create a contract document. I hope I'm being explicit enough about this outline for everybody. So you, you, you follow the entire process. You create a contract document. The contract document is a contract between the owner and the uh, would-be construction company. And it incorporates both the design drawings and the uh, uh, bills of quantities. It also incorporates setting licenses and approvals that will permit the work um, to progress um, during construction. When the construction team is engaged and the, uh, their job basically is to look at those bill of quantities, look at the designs that have been done and see how they can translate those into a real construction. So they start with site layouts, they create the, uh, the, 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 the set out, the, the set for foundation, they dig, excavate, they do all of those work and they start building the building. While this is going on, a few things are also happening. First, at the time the work is ongoing, much of the items captured in design drawings will not be at the level of detail that will enable actual artisans piece things together, like piecing wood together to form these or piecing, uh, putting form work to create a certain casting. You now have to start producing workshop drawings that make up what we call construction drawings. So design drawings different from construction drawings. Construction drawings are more blown out uh, they are more detailed. Uh, they are more work process focused. So that's the one that tells you uh, specifications of various materials, how they interlink, how materials are worked, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So the design and the bill of quantities that go into the contracts, those three now come together to be used by the construction um, uh, uh, team to produce construction drawings with which the actual construction work will now be done. So the work is now ongoing. Um, but while construction is ongoing, certain documentation is also uh, supposed to be uh, generated. For example, if there are variations, because of course, every construction will have some form of variation, minor or major, in different aspects of the construction. Documentation of the history, documentation of the activities and the processes that go into that construction need to be taken place, including variation and how those variations comply with the requirements of the construction uh, contract, uh, construction contract that is being built, right? So um, that is ongoing at that time. Uh, all forms of inspections, all forms of quality assurance, quality control is taking place during construction. And there's a lot of uh, value engineering where um, you are always evaluating uh, how long has gone into it according to a, against plan, how much has gone into it against plan, what's been produced, what's on ground, what's outstanding uh, as at any point in time. That's value engineering. You are doing that 
during the construction uh, process. All of that leads to a complete delivery of a facility. But a facility delivery is not just the physical structure. And this is something that we as facility managers need to be very, uh, 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 you know, very conscious of. The physical structure may look so fine, so clean, so nice, all the structures, uh, electrical system, mechanical system looks so tidy and well done. We walk through the building and everything looks exquisite. The documentation that comes out of the construction process is the other half of that process. If you get a very well-built building without proper documentation, you have received the half of the building. The half of the building is the physical structure. The other half is the documentation that needs to come um, out of it. And we're going to look at those as we go on um, to hand over. But of course, when the construction is ready, you've done all those documentation. What do you now do next? You now start doing testing. Testing is done at a system or component level to see if the uh, equipment, building, component, or structural element is functioning OK, which means, for example, if I want to check if my air conditioning is, fun air conditioning is functioning OK, I'll just probably put my hand around it and feel that it's cooling very well, get a, a thermometer and put around it and see that it's giving me 16 degrees like it says on the screen. That is testing. Testing is to record the operating parameters that I expect, put them on a sheet like a lab test, uh, I put uh, tools or uh, equipment or devices to check what I'm getting as real time, real life, record it against it, comparing my expected operational output with what I'm uh, getting uh, in terms of uh, protein parameters and then interpreting that just similar to what you have in your, in your, in your blood test uh, uh, result. When you go to the lab to go and do a test and then they say, oh, they are testing you for malaria. And then they have that uh, you know, uh, plasmodium uh, uh, range, which is normal. And then the one that is abnormal, right? So they put that in the range or they check you for your, your blood, uh, uh, red blood cells. Oh, for male is this range, for female is this range, right? Now that is available there. What you now do next is to take your, is to take your, 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 uh, uh, what do you call it? Your actual result and put it against what is expected. And then you now compare the two of them and interpret it. That's what testing does. So once they say something is tested okay, it means that if it should work within a certain temperature range, it's within that range. If the vibration should be a certain range, it should be that range. Whatever the range is that is normal as prescribed by the manufacturer, that's what you expect that testing to provide. But testing and commissioning are two different things. Commissioning is not the day you inaugurate a building. <laughs> the day you cut a tape and say we have, we have acquired and we're moving to the building, that's not commissioning. Commissioning is actually a more complex process than testing. Why testing checks for functionality, commissioning checks for adequacy. Not many textbooks will give you this clear distinction between the two. You keep hearing of testing and commissioning as if it is one activity, it's not the same activity. In the case of the air conditioner that we were discussing about a while ago, that um, it's not, it's cooling, but it's not um, making people cool in that environment, right? Uh, that AC might pass testing requirements or to fail commissioning requirement because people who are in that space are not, um, being cool, they are feeling hot, even though the AC is working. So when you are checking for adequacy, you actually need to load your facility and then observe how the facility responds to that loading. For example, for electrical uh, power producing equipment, you actually need to provide enough load to see if a 300 kilowatt rated generator will actually feed 300 kilowatts and not cough and burn down, right? So that's what commissioning is. Um, if you are trying to commission a stairwell, for example, oh, this stairwell is designed to evacuate 50 people per minute, right? Per, from each floor. Fine, ring a bell. 50 people should run out of the, of the building and walk downstairs and let's see whether anybody got a fractured in a bone or somebody got sprained or somebody fell down, pushed in the process or whatever happened, right? Or how long it took to actually come out and do that calculation to say, oh, this stairwell is commissioned, okay, right? 
So that's that's the difference. So let's let's try and know that clear difference so that we don't make the mistake anymore. And then the obedience condition it moves into handover. Handover is not keys and handshake. I've made this clear in this class before. Handover is documentation. So all of the documentation we produce during construction. Added to the documents we produce during testing, added to further documents we produce during commissioning, all come together to form your handover documentation. And we're going to be looking at a series of documents that you should look out for as facility managers before you can now say, I'm taking over this facility. Of course, the keys are important and the pictures are important. All those handover things and ceremonies that we do, yes, they are all important. But ensure that handover is documentation. And we're going to look at a list of things that you be required to have when you are taking over a facility. You move that facility into uh, FM, which means um, because you now have an asset register, you can develop uh, a maintenance program, you can develop a service specification document and service level agreements with the users. You can go into contracting to select contractors to provide various services. You can set up a reporting system and inspection uh, templates for ensuring that the facility is being routinely operated and maintained. And all of that feeds back into the planning stage. After a series of years of facility management, what then do you have to deal with? Is this facility still adequate? Is it still needed? Are the activities that we set out to achieve with this facility at the onset still being required? If they are still being required, is, are there other ways to meet this requirement? Okay, so this is basically, this is basically what happens when you are doing um, this cycle. So you get back to that point again where you now say, should we get a new facility? We get to the good one, going to the end of this useful life. And then if we need to, then yes, we start the process again. This is typically what FM should understand about development cycle of a facility. So today's class really is about operational readiness. It's about uh, starting to think about the end while you are still at the beginning. Uh, how do we how do we manage a facility from construction to delivery in such a way that operational activities will be smooth and seamless? That's what um, operational readiness is: a system for seamless transfer of a building from construction into full operation in a structured manner in an agreed program. So typically buildings will go through this model, design, build, commission, operate. Um, and what we're advocating and which we expect all FM should also form you know, part of what you know and what you can provide as contribution to your organization is the fact that the FM contributes to every stage in this process. The planning stage is handled by the planning team, but the FM and the construction team have inputs. The design team handles the design stage but of course, the uh, 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 construction and the FM have some input. Then the construction guys handle the construction stage. And then what happens? The uh, planning, design, and FM team has input. The testing stage is driven by who? Construction people. Commissioning stage is driven by who? Construction people. And then the same thing that happens with the handover stage. In all these three stages, the FM must be closely involved. You cannot be absent during testing. You cannot be absent during commissioning. You, of course, you cannot be absent during handover. Handover is directly to you, right? But then transition happens during, during these three phases, and then you take over the uh, facility, and you now become the driver. The planners, the designers, and the construction team now begin to have input, at least for the first few years. Uh, for the construction team and design team for the design team probably for the first one year construction team probably for another one year one and a half years and then after that they're out of the way and then you just work with the planning team which is the owner or the strategist for the organization right so basically what does the fm now do at each of these stages because that question will all often uh, come out when it now looks as if you are trying to increase relevance for the fm what do you what do you uh, contribute to the design stage, the planning stage, the budget, the, um, the uh, construction stage, testing and commissioning and handover stage? That's what we're going to look at now. At the design stage, the facility manager basically is the owner's representative. Um, before FM became popular in Nigeria, there used to be this position called clerk of works. 
clerk of works in construction sites um, used to be that person who represents the owner who is trying to take accountability for all that's going on in the site and showing that the contract is being complied to, right? That person is usually the one that the owner will expect to be able to run the facility throughout after that, uh, after that delivery has taken place, right? And the expectation is that this person has some experience with the user, his the owner, his organization, and the users of that building, such that you'll be able to spot and identify things that will come to haunt or bedevil the use of that facility in the future. So at this stage, the facility managers or the FM consultant, if appointed to the project, will review the owner's project requirements and the basis of design documentation for clarity and completeness. This is where all the things, all the I's needs to be dotted, all the T's needs to be crossed, just to ensure that what was originally intended was captured in design, was captured in bills of quantities, was captured in contract documents. Because many times, an original concept or idea might be lost in the process of de developing the uh, other documentation. I have seen situations where um, designers, out of convenience, just to create a certain shape, for example, end up with a, 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 an aspect of the design that completely frustrates the owner, right? But at, at the time that design was released, the owner probably oversighted it and didn't have someone else who will basically say, this is what I think my owner would like to see. For example, many people build estates all over the place. And then they try to sell these estates when the estates are built, right? Um, decisions to buy a house that will become your final home, like your home, after you have worked for 15 years and you want to now buy a home as a worker, especially for those, I mean, of course, by the time you are doing that, most people are married, and they are looking for a place where they can settle their family into, right? Um, many people design and <laughs> end up with something that will be difficult to sell, or even when people try to buy it and use them, they will not be satisfied living in it. They provide the wrong sizes or spaces for certain um, 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 types of, of rooms. For example, some bathrooms are no bigger than this, my table, right? And um, there are some people that it is in the bathroom that they find their luxury. That's where they find their real enjoyment, right? Some like a kitchen that will be so large that you can actually have a, a family dinner. You can actually chat inside the kitchen, right? So who is supposed to provide that information into it? It is the FM or the owner's representative. So basically, someone who's experienced with the users and the owner will provide that information. Just ensure that the designers don't get lost in this is how we used to do it and fully represent what you expect to be in that design. Same thing with the bill of quantities and the construction contracts, everything must be captured. And then commissioning, we describe this as um, uh, uh, testing or checking for adequacy, right? Commissioning actually starts throughout the process of design. You have to set up a team to be ensuring that everything that is being designed and being intended for building is going to meet the requirements of the owner. So we call that commissioning already from the onset. The FM takes care of that. Quality management and commissioning meetings take place. The FM participates in those. Reviews of design drawings and specifications at various stages. The FM must be one, the final reviewer. Let all those experts, all the uh, consultants do all the review of all the drawings. No, Ahala is fine. But until the FM has done his own review, that design should not be uh, finalized. For example, there are so many issues that um, a design would throw up as from an FM point of view. Um, you are building a large facility and you didn't provide uh, uh, staff quarters with waiting uh, uh, rooms and with changing rooms and shower points, for example. Or you are providing the large high-rise buildings that's gonna be locked up at the end of the day without providing ancillary facilities for security guards and other people on site to be able to use, uh, thereby creating a flow of traffic from security guards into the main building uh, during the day and then no access during the night, right? Um, all kinds of issues, including maintenance issues. Like, um, I know you know how aesthetically pleasing it can be to have all your chambers and manholes tucked away, cleaned up, interlocked and paved over, right? with no evidence of how to reach them. 
And then while you are doing all of that for aesthetic purposes, you are also using four inch pipe to run drainage in facilities with 90 degree bends all over the place, right? Um, so the FM is the one that knows that uh, we, if, you, if you are going to leave those pipes that are four or five inches in place with those 90 degree bends, I must have a chamber at every point where they touch down so that I can enter and unblock because I will be unblocking every time. <laughs> but, but if you want to seal up all of those places and ensure that everything is tidy and I never have to do any of those uh, chamber unblocking, then use nine inches um, uh, drain pipes and 45 degree bends, right? So those are the kind of things that the FM puts in because at, the, at that point, you are not only looking at what it takes to finish the job. You are looking at what it will take to run that facility for 100 years. All kinds of complications that can come to the FM at design stage, solve them. You know, we did that graph in one of our earlier classes about um, how difficult it becomes as the, as, the, as the building is going, advancing in its life cycle to make changes, right? So now that you are still in design, it is easier to make those changes. It's easier to allow for manholes, for chambers, for bigger pipes and a 45 degree angle bends, um, for valves at certain places, you know, all and all. So you must review not just architectural, but mechanical, plumbing, you know, everything, um, including structural. You know, you'd be surprised how some uh, engineers will just line pillars in some places and those pillars you know, 900 by 900 uh, 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 mm wide uh, uh, pillars that will now obscure view. You are the one that is going to use that space. You should be able to advise and say, is there another way to array these pillars so that we can still be able to maintain a certain critical view of 100 people in this hall, for example, right? If people sit in a room and they all have to be dodging pillars to see what's happening in front there, the only person that can visualize this is the person that we live with them, not the people who are building. Those who are building want to just build and get away, right? So the FM has to be part of all of this. Um, contract documents must include quality assurance is built into it. Many contracts are falling apart because you did not put a line item to do quality assurance. You didn't put a line item to do commissioning activities. You didn't put line items to do uh, uh, as build drawings. I've seen contractors being beaten up and down. Go and give us as view drawings, my dear. As view drawings cost money. You know why? It is not a modification of design drawing. It is not an adaptation of construction drawing. It's a fresh effort to measure what has been built. That's what as view drawing is. So I have to actually get people to tape, mark, write, and draw to produce as view drawings. So why do you expect that a controller should just produce as good drawings for you for free when you do not put a line item to price it as a job? It is the FM job to ensure that this is done. So while I'm taking the design drawings on one side, construction drawings on one side, I want to ensure that the as good drawings is also uh, captured. The same thing with as good bits of quantities, the same thing with everything from performer to actual. That's what I'm talking about. That change must be documented. And then, of course, uh, during the uh, course of, of, uh, of construction, all kinds of value engineering considerations will come up. Um, there will be variations. Variation control in your construction project should include a line item. What variation control does is this. Um, what can lead to a variation will be defined. What are the conditions that a variation can be triggered to be defined? Who can trigger them will be defined. And when a variation is legitimately triggered, what considerations should be made? Who should make those considerations and analysis to ensure that it's a system view that is applied to that change? For example, somebody says, oh, well, we didn't find the type of um, vitrified tiles that um, was specified, but we have this other porcelain tiles that is the same color, right? If you have the same color, in the porcelain tile, is it as thick? Can it resist the pressure? Is it a rough or smooth or glazed? Can it create the friction to prevent? Uh, so those are the kind of things that other people reviewing, one person's review, maybe the access review might just be, oh, it's the same color, it's fine, go ahead, right? Um, the project manager 
Is it the same cost? Is it cheaper? Is it it's cheaper? Go ahead, right? Everybody has different things that will make them say, make the change, right? But every of those considerations must be done holistically. At the end, you now say, go ahead or don't go ahead. Because if it is cheaper, that man wants it to be changed. If it is the same color, this man wants it to be changed. But if it's going to be slippery and children are going to be falling and breaking their heads, are we still going to make the change? So those are the kind of questions that happen. So you must take those variation change control to make sure it goes through um, other members of the team. And the FM must be key to that process. So you don't just wake up and hear that, oh, they've changed something. And then ensure that your test procedures are in place. I've seen testing being done by large contractors. I mean, I'm talking of foreign contractors, Italians and Lebanese coming to do testing. And what they are doing is walking around with their hands up like this, showing you, see, it's working, see, it's working. I said, what testing is this? Where are your documentation for the testing sheets? Where are the tools you're using to read what I'm seeing and recording on the paper? Because I'm going to sign something with you at the end of this testing. And I need to be able to see these are the standard operating parameters in ranges, upper and lower specification limits of these ranges of, for each parameter. And this is what we checked. This is the temperature. This is the range that it should be. This is what we actually checked. What's the interpretation? Write it there. They don't want to do that. And I said, no, I'm not going to be part of this testing uh, program. I will not put my signature on a document that um, um, uh, uh, does not uh, make sense. We all need to be familiar with what should happen during testing. So during design stage, you're actually ensuring that the consultants are also producing testing sheets. Testing sheets. Because when it gets to the time for testing, those testing sheets will be pulled out of the contractor's construction contract documents and used for the work. Because everything, anything that is not done inside the contract will become a variation. The same way we expect um, as view drawings will be produced and we need to provide line icons for them, okay? So everything that will have to uh, uh, happen at the design stage, the FM has a role in it. What about the construction stage? Quality assurance must be going on in a logical, sequential and efficient manner. What is quality assurance? The processes that are put in place to prevent errors to ensure that the design and the construction proceeds smoothly and delivers the result as intended. So if you are having processes, if you are creating audit tools, if you are creating uh, uh, you know, uh, system checks of work processes, work activities, materials being deployed, you are doing quality assurance. You also have quality control that is also taking place at this point. Quality control happens at a delivery point. Quality control is that check you do on a deliverable. So you say, oh, you finished casting, this concrete is ready. If I go there and do a structural test on the concrete, I do any other check on the concrete, I'm doing quality control to be sure that that slab is working, right? It's okay for me. But if I have a checklist for ensuring that uh, when you are doing mixes, the mixes follow the right formula, you correct, produce the right grade of, of, of concrete mixture, um, the hardening process or curing process, follow the right process. That is a quality assurance. Quality assurance goal is to ensure that there is no error in the process. That's why we call it a process-driven quality management principle. Quality assurance is a process-driven. You plan to prevent issues in a process, not at a deliverable. Quality control is a product-focused quality management principle, which means you have finished or you are at a certain milestone and you are checking for errors. So quality control is after the facts. Quality assurance is before the facts, okay? So that's why sometimes when I hear somebody being called quality assurance, quality control, QAQC man, manager, I wonder how you can wear both hats, except you are good at wearing two hats at different times, like two face, right? Having one face at one point and then having another face at another point. Right, because as a quality control officer, you are there to catch the failure of quality assurance. That's your job, right? As a quality assurance officer, you are there to ensure that there's nothing for quality control to do. 
if quality assurance is done very well, there will be nothing for quality control to do. Okay, ensure that these things are built into the construction process so that at the end of the day, you don't have to give excuses or explain why things could not meet up the way the customer wanted it. Okay. And then, of course, facility management should be involved in site meetings. Site meetings. During site meetings, you'll be surprised at the kind of things they are discussing. Almost everything that they had planned for a project will not be available again. Everything will be changed. The price will be changing. Materials will be disappearing from markets, right? Everybody looking for every way to make every kind of changes to your project. It's important that you do inspections continuously while the construction is ongoing. In fact, there are some construction teams that are very good at covering up without doing properly what should be inside before the burying and covering up takes place. So you see joints that were not properly sealed. They just cast concrete around it, for example. Okay. And then during this process, ensure that the operations and maintenance documentation is taking place. It's doing construction. You know, when they bring all these heavy equipments and they bring them to sites, way bills are being generated. Those are opportunities for you to just start picking up assets, uh, asset data, at least if you are not the one that will be doing it, ensure that someone in the contractor's team is putting together a set of data according to a template that you provide. So when transformer is dropped in, they'll populate it. When generators are dropped, they populate it. When the you know, elevators and the, and the motors around them are dropped in, they'll populate those documentation. And then you begin to compile commissioning records. You know that it's during construction and commissioning take place. All testing and commissioning are expected to happen before handover, right? And because they are expected to happen before handover, testing and commissioning is usually expected to be done as part of the contractor responsibilities, right? So uh, you might have you might have achieved substantial completion, which means the facility is now ready for use. People can actually move in and start using them, but you can still be doing testing and commissioning as an ongoing process. Okay, the record of testing and commissioning, make sure that it's done. Make sure that the operational maintenance manuals are in place. And then, you know, during construction, there are a lot of issues that will crop up that they have solved one way or the other, right? Ensure that there's an issues log that is being um, maintained because those issues log, they will form the historical background that you will need to survive operating and maintaining that facility eventually. Because there are some things that they have encountered that they have solved in a particular way that you did not know that that's how they have solved it. You will not have any basis for the solutions you'll be offering. All right, I'm gonna give us a, a little break and then we'll come back and look at FM during post-construction stage. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. So post-construction stage, present the clients and supervising required actions during defect liability and deficiency corrections. And thereafter provide the final testing documentation and final commissioning reports. So the FM is at that point where all of those issues around defect liability, this is really taking over. This is really you exerting your authority on the project on behalf of the owner. Um, assist with pre-qualification and, select and selection of FM service providers, uh, come up with service level agreements. You fully understand who will use the facility. We create um, service specifications. Uh, warranty is also a very big matter at this point. Get all the warranty documentation, you monitor warranty compliance, because if you don't, there's a likelihood that you would operate it and miss, so make it a wrong move that will create a, a problem um, for you in the, in, the, in, in the various components you're managing. And then begin to solve problems um, as the building is being used. Um, suggestions for improvements and recording them with O&M manuals. Uh, coming up with areas you know that may come under warranty so that you know you, you can trigger warranty uh, redress for such issues and then reports documents for the services that will be uh, implemented all the reports that need to be created for the various activities needs to come in at this stage and then just ensure that the building is is, is being properly served and we've talked through the FM startup information requirements before in other classes, but it's important that we talk about it here because since you're going to be the one taking over the facility, you must understand the vendors um, that work in the facility, you must understand their con have their contacts, you must know all kinds of agreements that are in place for the land and, and for other uh, installations, uh, contact information. This basically applies to virtually all types of facility you are taking over, whether it's a new build, or a handover from a construction site. Just pay attention to this. They will really help you um, in making decisions as you do your operations and maintenance. Okay, so all that we'll be talking about since will not happen automatically. Um, you will not just have senior management reasoning with you this way and saying, oh, well, yes, we know you are the FM. We know you can, you should be involved and blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't always work that way, right? So you need to come up with like a business case to say, these are the reasons why you need to have either myself as the FM or an FM consultant invited to join the team for this um, um, uh, type of uh, work for new projects that we're engaging. And don't, don't, don't forget the fact that Max Miguel provides these services um, um, as part of a standard service, okay? So we can support the entire development process and save you hundreds of millions in, in years to come. Management needs to know this. They get that buying, they get that uh, 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 buying, and then they begin to do the marrying of parties. Real estate guys and construction guys, they don't recognize you as valuable in any way. They see you as an impediment to their work. Real estate guy is thinking about how to build it cheap and rent it or sell it high with a high margin. It's, in and out, that's how real estate work, right? Or, uh, you know, if it's, if it's for the long haul, they want to put money in, watch it grow over a few years, but they don't recognize the fact that even the FMs that are going to create that value over the years. So having the, uh, the, the teams, depending on the structure your organization is running, there could be a project management department, a control department, real estate property management department, there must be a marrying of all of these uh, departments to ensure that they, it is seamless. And, and, and the major reason why you need to have an operational readiness program in place is to ensure that documentation being produced by various contractors and subcontractors and, and, and service providers and consultants follow a certain format that will enable you to have a, an organized, instead of having something so chaotic uh, in different formats being delivered to you, you can now have a proper documentation that will help you set up a preventive maintenance program that will help you to uh, save time, structured, organized, uh, easy to follow, uh, process of assessing documents and data. 
not uh, the mumbo jumbo that we currently get in most contracts. I've seen some contracts that when they really want to punish you as you are pushing and pushing for documents, you know what they will do? They'll go and give you um, paper documents in A3 prints, right? So you can't do nothing with. <laughs> you cannot extract data from those paper documents into a spreadsheet, right? There's virtually nothing you can do with those documents, but that's a very hard of giving to see. Sure, you want as good drawings and documents. There you go, right? But if you have talked with them, um, you have this program in place, you, you'll get AutoCAD, AutoCAD files, you'll get uh, PDF files, right? Um, and for those that worked with 3D, you will get, you get Revit files as well. Um, so you can easily extract information. You can save us and change formats and extract information from soft copy files. But to achieve this, you need to have uh, the basic ingredient for a successful operational readiness, ensure that there is operational maintenance program, testing and commissioning program, and handover program. These three programs are actually broken down for very large projects, right? But for your small project that you've involved, maybe an expansion of your, of your facility, maybe a new head office or um, uh, a similar project, it would be a typical fusing of all of this into what we call the operational readiness program. So you can call it the operational readiness program instead of having a separate handover program, testing and commissioning program, operational maintenance program. Just call it operational readiness program. And you incorporate all the aspects of these three programs. When done well, there's a huge uh, uh, savings that you can experience. Um, if you think about the difference between the original design and construction costs and the O&M costs over the useful life of that asset, 10% to 62%, it will give you a sense of why you should get it right. Why spending that 10%? Because if you get it wrong there, this 90% um, uh, left uh, over the next 100 years would become a nightmare. You spend so much more. So we look at it from an input throughput pro, uh, output uh, approach where you are not waiting. You are not waiting for just um, what is the delivered to you. You are putting your eye into what is going to go into their process. So let's take the throughput as the construction process, the output as the uh, final building that is handed over to you as an FM. You are not going to wait for it at, at, at the end here. You are supposed to look straight back into the input and ensure that before design, before construction, you are making the right um, uh, contribution. And this is the same uh, asset life cycle we looked at at the beginning um, and, and a further breakdown of the FM startup information, which I have covered extensively and in details in a previous class, and I'm not going to do that again in this class. So if you get your operational readiness right, capital investment will be protected. The equipment will last for its design life. Uh, it will ensure reliability of income stream for the organization. So there will be uh, ready uh, uh, you know, inflows uh, for that investment. When should you launch an operational readiness program? Design stage or early stage of construction? The answer is as early as possible before construction. So I will tell you that design stage is the worst stage at which you can start the operational readiness thinking and planning. It should actually start at the planning stage. So the planning stage is where um, you have basic agreements on what the brief for that project should look like. And that brief should include a fourth dimension. Let me tell you why the fourth dimension is very important. When projects are going to be initiated, there's usually that uh, uh, constraints to be considered. We, we, we have this amount, so budgetary uh, constraint, we must meet or we'll develop this project in this one billion, nothing more. We must develop it at this time, make sure it, uh, uh, it's done within one year. They, they, they put that as objective. They also have the objective of ensuring that the scope to be covered in terms of how many square meters, the grade of materials are also captured inside that. So they, they have those, but those are all construction or project focused um, uh, objectives. If you bring in operational readiness as a fourth objective, what you get is that um, there is now consideration for the long-term um, impact or implication of all actions to be taken throughout that construction process. It now becomes four objectives. 
project management three objective and one traffic management objective, which automatically becomes overriding because the whole reason why you are building for these three objectives is to deliver to FM is to make sure that the facility is usable by the users and value can be created. And because of that, this fourth objective become very important. So when you are writing, working with the owners to develop the brief at the onset, ensure that the fourth objective, which is operational readiness, is built into your planning. Okay. Um, and, and then, so when you look at the operations and maintenance manual, you are talking about how the a documentation will take place, the o &M manuals, the asset registers will be uh, compiled, um, the standard way format templates that will be used. Um, and what goes into the o &M, uh, plan, schedule of assets. This is basically your asset register, your pressure and maintenance manual that is going into this one. All the assets, describe them. Parts lists, components lists, spare parts, uh, all the things to test and, 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 and commission them, your maintenance program, your, your operating manuals on how they should be maintained and so on and so forth. That's what goes to the o and um, uh, 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 O&M uh, pressure and maintenance manual or plan. And then we get into the testing and commissioning manual. It also includes how the testing and commissioning will, will take place, the roles and responsibilities of various parties, uh, what kind of procedures we're going to use for our testing and commissioning, they are all considered at this point. Um, and then I'll just go straight to what it expects of you um, when you do the um, uh, testing and commissioning. Uh, so the interface between construction, quality assurance and operations, what testing and commissioning is trying to do. One is what is being installed or being created functional, will it, will it work? And two, Will it meet the needs for which it is being intended or being designed? So uh, you ensure that all of those uh, results from testing is recorded as build drawings are produced, as build bits of points are produced, snag lists of all defects at the end of construction is co compiled, GIS coordinate, vendor details, guarantees and warranties, manufacturer recommendation, and so on and so forth. These are things that the testing and commissioning process helps to extract from the construction um, uh, process. And then you get to the handover, okay? So how is handover, how is handover supposed to take place? Uh, who, who, who would trigger that the job has been substantially completed for us to start the process of handover? Um, what kind of templates are going to be involved? Uh, what kind of procedures will be involved in the handover? They are discussed at this stage. And all the rules are set up. Basically, I told you that handover is about handing over documents, not stories, not pictures. So all of those things we have compiled from all of the construction to date are packaged together into a handover um, documentation that you receive at the end of a construction. At this point, FM kicks in. And once FM kicks in, all the other things we'll be discussing, the remaining 29 classes in this series will kick in as well. All right, there is an assessment for this class. Um, 10 questions as usual. Um, that is due at the end of today, at least before we touch this class. Okay. So let me hear your questions. I'll give you a minute to look over your notes and uh, pop your hand up for questions. Okay.
Okay, let's hear from Adebowale. Let me first, though. <laughs> okay, good evening, class. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My question is, Mr. Paul, you know me, I like, let's see it practical very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this transition between, uh, let me say, developer to facility management, mm -hmm. especially when you are not, uh, maybe you are not in the whole team when they started, maybe mm -hmm. they just brought you in at uh, maybe like 90% uh, of completion. Mm -hmm. Then there's this, maybe their clause or their marketing strategy is that um, uh, defend liability, the defend liability period of mm -hmm. maybe a year, some people are doing a year. Mm -hmm. And then you know, when FM now comes in and you now have uh, liability clauses, mm -hmm. and you're not telling them, oh yeah, come and meet up to this, your liability or come and replace all these parts. Mm -hmm. And they're not replacing it. They're not meeting up to that promise. Mm -hmm. And this time around, because FM is not the eyes to the client. Mm -hmm. It's not FM that they are dragging Oh yes. All the time. Oh yes. So in these cases now, do you now uh the question is how do you handle it? Do you bring the developer, the developer to the limelight saying that oh they are not the one meeting, or you just expose them completely to the client and say, come go and meet the person that actually <laughs> gave you that warranty clauses? That's my question. Uh that's a tricky one. Now let me tell you why that is tricky. <laughs> Many developers are also having a hand in the selection of the FM. So in a way, you are going to bed with this, <laughs> with this developer. The, the reason they preferred you is that you will cover their backs, that you will protect them. They will create a lot of uh, problem on ground and they expect that you should be loyal enough to protect them, right? In fact, some developers want you to as much as possible drag the issue so that it will go outside the liability period so that they will say, ah, no, it's no longer valid, right? Um, now, so you have that conundrum. You have that, um, of course, the contract should be enforced. That is straightforward. The contract is clear. If, there's, if there are certain types of defects within 12 months, developer comes back, right? Now, um, so, so, but what I normally will recommend is that FMs, before you take up a new site, work with developers to have a fund, a percentage of the entire construction should be reserved as a fund for different liability. So if they build for 1 billion naira, for example, they should ideally should be 5%, but that's not practical. Even if it is 2% or 2.5%, of that 1 billion, they put out and say, for the next 12 months, this money is locked in. Because you know that um, the owners are supposed to contribute to a capital asset replacement or infrastructure charge, according to what we, 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 how we put it in, in the assets, right? To ensure that those things are sustained on an ongoing basis. The developer is supposed to make his own contribution to ensure that the assets that were built remain valid for the period they have guaranteed in their own documentation. And that has to be backed by funds. But some developers are very generous. You know that when you are moving into a new estate, uh, because they want to sell, they will subsidize the lifestyle of the early adopters. For example, they will not throw the entire utility bill for common areas on, on the two people that are in the estate. They will not throw the cost of maintaining the swimming pool on the five people that are in the estate, right? So they'll keep putting money um, into um, uh, that maintenance, ensuring that the FM can get reimbursed uh, even when recouping of those service charge is not happening, right? So, so there's usually that you know, balance that needs to happen. So I think the FM companies should get more involved with developers in that discussion on how to onboard a new estate. It's supposed to be a whole process worked out in a very complex uh, 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 agreement that has every detail captured in it. Because when you are coming to the estate, you're having a contract with the residents. It shouldn't necessarily be a contract with the developer. 
your work in that estate. You see, we contract with the owners and residents, right? Now, you should not have a separate contract with the developers that address their defect liability. Now, for many developers, they'll say, you know what, we're going to have a standby team on ground who are going to be attending to these issues for one year. And those people can also support you in your FM, but they will be the one who are going to be sending money to, to fix whatever issues that they encountered. This thing should be documented. It is, sometimes we just take it because, oh, we are grateful to them for giving us a job, we move in, and then <laughs> we start facing all these realities. So, so please try and document it. I'm not saying go and start fighting developers because they're the ones giving you job, right? <laughs> Don't fight them. But try and in a very diplomatic way document how the relationship will be for the first one year, okay? Maritella. Good evening. Thank you for the lecture. Yeah, yeah my question is, the testing, does it go alongside with construction or after construction? Both testing and commissioning goes alongside with construction. Anything that is delivered is tested and commissioned. Now, so it the might difference be, is, it might... the difference, let me just finish that, that thought line. The difference is that testing can happen before occupation, but commissioning cannot happen before occupation. Because it is true occupation, you do commissioning. Yes, you can go on with the question now. You, you, you've answered it already. Okay, fantastic. You've answered it already. Excellent. Fatima, let's hear from you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, class. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's as if you've answered my post, my questions especially from the previous speaker before the last speaker. Okay. But again, I'm still in that dilemma that is leading me to say, go meet your contractor. Remember the last speaker before this last one, yeah. who says, should he go to ask the, the, the client to say, go and talk to the, the contractor. Mm -hmm. I'm presently in that stage, <laughs> but, Again, we need to, I need to understand how I should handle this. Yes. Now I have a branch that has been handed over to me mm -hmm. in less than two months. Mm -hmm. As I speak, the defects are so, so alarming. I've started this quarreling. You say I should not quarrel with the, the, the developers or yeah. the contractor itself. <laughs> that has happened already, Paul. <laughs> So, and it keeps happening. Imagine yes. the consultant. The consultant is telling me, uh, I'm not the one to make, to fix issues. So when, next time you want to talk, go talk to the contractor. He's the one that we, <laughs> knowing the woman, knowing who we are, yes. I get back to him and say, I wish the bank had understand that this is not your job. Yes. They would have not consulted you to do this job. All I want you is for you to get this, because, Paul, I don't know for Nigeria, but Sierra Leone, the Lebanese community, is, 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 they, they dominate the market. Mm -hmm. And at times, I don't know if our people check them, they know them, if mm. they KYC them properly, mm. to know these guys are fit for purpose. Mm. But trust me, with my two projects that I've handled with them, I mm. told the one like yesterday, regarding it, though, imagine you fixing up a branch. Within that new branch, there is this toilet door. Mm -hmm. And that is a new branch. We call the branch a next gen branch. Mm -hmm. You, I noticed something on that door. Called you, sent emails that come, this door is going to fall down. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that the door is right at the center of the banking hall. Mm -hmm. You come to that door away. Promise to bring it on a Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. As at yesterday, the door was not fixed. You don't know who to talk to, and we are not. We are not at the center of giving them this contract up to ninety percent, as the last speaker said. Oh. So sometimes you just get confused. Oh. You don't know who to talk to, but everybody is coming to FM to say this is happening. 
you are tempted to say, look, don't talk to me. Go talk to your management that gave these people contract. But you are, you, your hands are tied. You yeah. say that. Yeah, you can you say that. You are seen as if you don't know your job. Yes, sure, sure. So, so I don't know how to do this. The second part you spoke of testing and commission. I don't understand the reverse you said. Okay. And commissioning should happen before handing over. Something okay. just refresh that. For okay, me. so 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 testing can be done um, as soon as any asset is delivered within a project. If a generator is installed, it can be tested and certified. Okay, even if the gen is going to be using for the it's going to be used for the construction of the rest uh, aspect of the of the job, right? If a borehole is drilled and as the first aspect and the water is going to be used for the construction that ball can be tested okay commissioning is when the the adequacy of that asset is also checked testing is for functionality the ball will bring in our water that's testing right um is the water having so and so parameters in terms of uh, dissolved solids uh, microbial load and so on and so forth those are all testing to be sure the ball will be working but is the borehole producing uh, enough water? Is the borehole uh, meeting the requirements for water in all kinds of quality and volume? That's what commissioning does, right? So in essence, testing will be done anytime it is, uh, a component is delivered. But commissioning is when that component is put to use. It is doing the use, doing the loading of any component that you are doing commissioning. You are documenting the adequacy, you know, uh, you are comparing what is, that component is doing compared to what it was intended to do. That's commission. That documentation process where you're doing a commission. Now, let me go straight to that uh, uh, issue of, in fact, the entire class that we have today, this design build commissioning class, is just to solve that one problem Fatima is going through now. First, some people create the contract, design the job roll out the project, supervise the entire project and bring Fatima in at the end to say, come and take over. That's what we're trying to fix now. So next time you have a project ongoing Fatima, please use these issues you are dealing with now as your business case to management to Definitely. put you into the construction team. You must attend every site meeting, for example. You must be part of the snag listing. You must be part of all inspections, all testing, all commission. You must be part of all of them. And every change from intention of original design in the construction must have your own sign off as part of the change control, management of change, MOC process on that project. If you can work your way into that level, you will avoid being in the situation you are in right now. But where you are right now, you really can't abdicate anymore. You have to own, you have to own the situation. It's not by quarrel, it's not by fight. If you have to beg and plead and you know uh, lure them to come and do the little thing to re release your stress right now, you just have to do it, right? Because now is not the time to start telling your customers, we are not one team anymore. <laughs> this whole project came from the devil and Jesus Christ, no. <laughs> We are all one team. And if the customer is having a sad experience, I, as the FM, am part of that sad experience. So my job will be to find a way around it. I must own it. I must find a way around it. If I have to drive to the contractor's uh, worker's site and carry one technician in my car to come and fix it, I will do it. You understand? So that is the recovery that takes place at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Tony. Oh. Tony, you can ask a question now. Like Tony's video is frozen. Okay, you're there. Good. Tony, you can go ahead. All right, sir. Hi, first of all, thank you for the lectures this evening. Thank you. When we started. It's a design, build, and commission. But the, yeah. the message sent to me says electrical. Yes, 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 yes. I, I explained I explained at the beginning of the class 
that uh, the the facilitator for the electrical class was talking a hold up and i had to be i had to be drafted in to take my next class which should not happen in maybe a week or so time that's why i'm here mm -hmm. that's baraka trying to be proactive just to ensure that she doesn't tell you to this class will not hold <laughs> Yeah. Okay, my question is this, sir. Where you were discussing on input, then throughout and output. Yes, input, throughput, process, output. Yes, sir. I was able to get that because that area is like a bit uh, faster. So I couldn't uh, get, uh, get it right at what, what you mean by the output. Okay. For the input, yes. Okay. So I don't know if I can quickly. For facility managers, yes, for facility managers, a complete building. It's an output for another group, from another group, isn't it? The construction team, yeah. right? So when the construction team finish building, they hand over to you. The building becomes an input to you, which you use to serve your users, right? Okay. What we are saying here is, instead of waiting for that output from that process that the construction team are going to use to deliver your building to you, start paying attention to their inputs, which starts from their planning, their brief, their design, construction documents, bill of quantities, everything that goes into the construction process, because the construction itself is the throughput. That's their process. That's what the construction team will do to deliver an output that becomes your input. Don't wait for their output. Pay attention to their own inputs and pay attention to their own throughput. In essence, what system thinking does is don't say that is not my business because that business that was not your business today will become your business tomorrow, right? So if <laughs> if we, we we were we as FMs were part of the construction, you know, from planning to design to construction, we will have less problems to deal with. Imagine if Fatima has to spend a lot of money fixing all this problem now because the contractors will not show up, right? All those will add to FM contract, FM budget. They will now say, oh. You are spending too much in your FM. Nobody will come and say, oh, well, um, it was the project team that produced an output that was so bad that you have to use your FM budget to fix things just to give your customers some comfort. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So those were, that's where the exactly. dilemma uh, comes from. So we should not ignore, oh, they are building. When they are done, they will call us. Some FMs do that deliberately. They say, oh, when they are done, they will call us. And some project team say, you know what? You are FM, forget it. We're not involving you. When we are done, we'll call you. <laughs> We must find a way to walk our way to that table where decisions are being made through that process before property is delivered to us. Ibukum, yeah, Ibukum, question. All right, sir. Thank you very much for the class. I just want to take us to the slide, just a few clarification. Uh, I'll start with slide six. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, yes, I just want to know the coloring there. Does, does it mean anything? The, the, the blue and the yellow. Then it... Okay, um, so so uh, the driver. Only the testing the, side. Yes, so if you, if you look at it, it's the driver and the, uh, and the inputs, right? So it just highlights who plays um, different roles. Uh, if you look at the bottom two uh, roles where you have the driver and the input, that explains everything. So forget about the coloring. It's just probably okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then uh, talking about uh, just a clarification too. I think that should be the slide fifteen. You talk yeah. about the um, the contractors, different contractors giving you uh, different uh, mm -hmm. documents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sizes and formats mm -hmm. and all of that. How mm -hmm. do you handle that? I'm not sure I get that clear. You, you get you get in at, on time to say all consultants produce your drawings in a flash drive in this format and that format. Okay, okay. Every time an asset is procured, the procurement people on site must document the serial number and model number and capacity in these templates. You get what I'm saying? When you provide those information at the onset, everybody works with the same understanding. Nobody will, I mean, I've seen there's a project I handled between 2019, 2020, where when they showed me the project documentation, I, 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 I almost fainted. There was a Ghana must go of CDs. There was a whole room of folders and folios of drawings. There was uh, one pack of uh, flash drives and we went 
I went with a team of six to go through all of those in two weeks. And you know what we found? This jointed documentation. This jointed documentation. In fact, we found close to 400 CDs that were blanks, but they were labeled. You know what they are submitting an invoice? They are supposed to submit progress reports. <laughs> they are supposed to submit progress reports um, with their invoice as different milestones. They became so used to the client not opening those CDs before processing their invoice because the contract says you must submit uh, update, like you want to do a variation change. You submit a CD of the change and you do all those simulations. And that's the expectation. They know the client will not open it. They've discussed it. I know the client will just process their invoice. So they kept submitting blank CDs with their paperwork. So at the end of the day, you will see all kinds of things um, in those documents. There are some CDs that were labeled wrongly. There were some that were cracked. I couldn't extract the files in them. All kinds of things we saw. So create a format. In fact, what we do nowadays is we have a system called OmTrack. What OmTrack does is to we'll create a, an online cloud-based folder system for everybody in the project. So you're not submitting anything by any hard means. From the place you generated it in your computer, you will log into OnTrack, you upload. As you upload, the process flow will go to the next person, to the clients, to the other consultant to review. Every drawing will be approved. Every bill of questions will be approved in the system. So at the end of the day, I don't need to look for anybody to give me any documents. Everything would have been in the system. The final set is what I would just download into my ONM manual. So that's where we're trying to get to deploy system to take care of this. But for now, insist on getting things in certain specified formats for everybody and setting um, uh, 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 templates for the kind of data you will need for operations and maintenance. Because the whole construction is for operational maintenance, it's for you, the FM. You must understand that and communicate to them that look, the way I want my food is how you serve it. If I must eat this meal, because you're handing over to me, this is how I want it served. That's what the FM does at this level. But of course, it must be done in a very gentle way because you know we are not as smart as this consultant. Many of them have been there since before we were born. So by the time you start coming to tell them all these things, they'll just wave you off and say, who is that? In fact, they can even call your boss and say, get this brat out of my sight. And your boss says will be intimidated by this consultant because their weight is very heavy when it comes to professional standing. So they'll say, the women say, leave them, they know what they are doing. They are the very good. This guy is the one that built that tower. If there is the one that built Dangote house, it's the one that built the dollar house. Don't worry, leave him, it's fine. Right? <laughs> Go to those houses where he's built and ask for documents of buildings that were built 10 years ago. You'll find you still struggle to have those documentation. So it's a software way we work ourselves into this kind of relevance. Okay. All right, sir. Please, uh, two slides move. 21. Slide 21. Okay. okay. Um, let me let me check and remember. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is I where I, I told mean, you that the operational operational readiness yeah. program okay. can be yes, created sir. as three different programs for a complex project. Okay, sir. But you can do you, everything in one program. Just ensure that the things listed in Slide uh, 29, slide is that 35, mm -hmm. and slide 41 are captured okay. as outputs from the entire process. All right. Okay. Okay, sir. So the, the, the last one is 31. Okay. Sorry, 35. Um, say the typical commissioning program can reduce energy costs five to so yeah i just want to understand that a little bit more it says typical commissioning program can reduce energy costs five to twenty percent on average yes so That's, so you know, take, you know take for adequacy, right yes okay when you are checking for adequacy you mm. are basically uh confirming that everything has been built right and to meet the needs of the customers and that's is a great way to manage your energy bills because you would your ACs. I just gave you an example in the earlier beginning of this class about how your AC may not be the problem, that how your windows and the doors that were not built well or that are, are falling apart might be your biggest problem when you're not getting good cooling. You understand? So that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
The last question is going to come from Olayemi, I think. Oh. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the elaborate class. Um, I want to, on page two, mm -hmm. was it page two? Uh, you are talking about, uh, actually I'm concerned about the designs is a stage. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned some documents, several documents there, under that design. Mm -hmm. um, you are talking about the workshop diagram, the... No, no, no. At the design stage, you have design drawings, which is made up of electrical, mechanical, plumbing, architectural, structural drawings. You have bill of quantities and you have construct, contract, con, construction contract document. That's what happens at design stage. Okay. But... <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm trying. I was trying to follow up to try to jot down, list out those uh, documents, but um, in between, I think um, I couldn't capture them. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I think you mentioned something like the site layout. Uh, the yeah, those, are part of, those are all part of your design drawing. So uh, when you're taking the architectural drawing, it starts with site layout. It starts with bubble diagrams first bubble diagrams, then schematics, right? And then from schematics, you now have the uh, uh, single line sketching of relationship between spaces. Because what you're basically doing at the first initial stage of design is to ensure that you can capture all the spaces required in that, in that uh, project. You can provide, you must provide for everybody from the space program that has been done. You understand? So that is what you are doing first. Before you start detailing and framing up the floor plans and framing up elevations and structural plans, I mean, and sectional and other plans, you have already taken data from your brief and your programming, and you have provided for all spaces. You've provided sizes for every space. You now start uh, you know, uh, giving them form uh, level by level. So that's, that's what I was trying to explain. I was trying to take you through the um, the, the process of design development, because design itself is not just go and design for me. No, design has a process. You, you go, you do one uh, set of work, you bring it back, the FM and the owner look at it and say, okay, this looks like the concept we are, we are trying to look at. You go again, you come back again. Oh, the flow works well, we like this flow. Um, have you provided for all the spaces we require? Yes, you provided for, all right, go and put dimensions on them. You put dimensions and bring it again. Say, oh, no, no, this kitchen is too small. Oh, that's, uh, laboratory is too big. Oh, this uh, security guard's uh, house is too small. How can we adjust? They go back, discuss and, and readjust, come back again, you know. And so, so there's an iterative process for design. Okay, sir. Um, but I, I would have just been uh, uh, maybe more, uh, uh, let me say prefer, or maybe say request if we can have uh, all this, um, the document at this design stage, maybe enlisted out for us so that we can, um, in case we have the, um, the opportunity to undo this kind of a project, to know what and what projects, I mean, documents we'll be looking at, applicable uh, documents we should be looking at. I think, I think what's important for you as an FM is the set of drawings we have uh, at the lower slides. Those, uh, those slides that list, yeah, the lists uh, uh, operations and operational uh, maintenance, testing and commissioning and handover. Those are the areas we should be focusing on because those are the things that become the input into the FM process. In fact, this design process, all of this back and forth in design, most owners don't want you to be the one doing that. What we ask you to do in doing design is just to be sure that the final design before they go to a bill of quantities and before they go into construction actually meets the owner's requirements. You understand? They won't expect you to be the ones providing the contract. In fact, many of them don't want to, to know the details of the contract they are signing with the con construction company. <laughs> so, so, so we are not trying to take over construction. We are just trying to be sure that the, the owner's requirements have been factored in. For example, I can look at the drawing, I can look at the uh, uh, bill of quantities and say, oh, uh, I hope this, on the, does this capture development of as due drawings, which is one of the things I have in those lists that I must request for, right? 
and it says, oh, as you join is not here, or I don't have business as you join, you now go back to the owner and say, please, that contract needs to be revised. There must be a line item for as built drawings because I am an organization and I must get as built drawings. All right. Sure. Some owners will say, oh, don't worry, the contractor will do it. We know he will do it. He's just talking. It's a lie. Make sure there's a line item. If that line item is going to be just 10,000 naira, let it be there in the contract. Yes, sir. So you mentioned the, the as built drawing, um, the, um, sorry, I put it down somewhere. I can't, um, I'm trying to figure out I mean, where I wrote it. Uh, when you so say, what I'm say, say, you said there are three kind of documents you mentioned there. The construction drawing, the as built, and the, the design drawing or something. Yes, there is a design drawing, there's construction drawing, there's as built drawing. Design drawing is what you generate from the brief, right? Construction drawing is all those blowouts to show work methods and materials uh, to be used for different processes during the construction. As view drawing is not related to these two sets of drawings. As view drawing is a fresh set of drawing that is measured and drawn. Okay. <clears throat> That means that there can be uh, significant differences in. in oh the yes, time. oh yes. Well, the first two may not have differences, uh, except variation is much. You know, during workshop drawing, uh, during construction drawing, variations are captured in construction drawing. So those are the main differences between. If it's just to blow it up, so that they can see more detail, there will be no difference between design, right? But if it is to show the impacts of a variation, then there will be a difference between construction drawing and design drawing. But as new drawing can be very different from both of them. So why would it be a difference since variation. Uh, the, the first two are supposed to lead to the third one? Exactly. So the expectation is that if the first one, the design drawing um, was well accounted for with construction drawing, the relationship will be established, right? And then if you document every change adequately during construction, as build drawing and construction drawing will not be much different. It will mean that you have accounted very well, but the reality on ground now is that variations are not documented accurately. Okay. I mean, for something as simple as, you know, so people will have a pillar that they were casting, the formwork collapsed, the pillar expanded by a certain triangle, in one shape, mm -hmm. they cannot chip it off. You know what they do? They use rendering. Mm -hmm. They use rendering. <laughs> they use plastering to create a different size oh, of pillar. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what you will see in construction drawing and in, as, and in design drawing would be 450 by 450. But what we'll be seeing on ground will be 500 or 550 by 750. <laughs> so it is as built that you measure and draw. Okay. So that means the as built, okay, as built is um, is created after the building is complete. Everything is ready. You start creating as built. Okay. okay so. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're welcome. Theodora, a question. So what, what is the, if the, uh, um, the, con uh, the contractor gives you an as, like the contractor doesn't give you as, as an as built, um, drawing. Mm -hmm. What? Do you, how? How do you? If it, if it's not in the contract and your organization is not ready to maybe pay extra to do that, how do you you can, get, it's, it's either you can bend down with your tape and measure by yourself and draw, or you get a consultant to come and help you do it. <laughs> we typically do that in Max the Good. That's one of the things that we have people doing every day, right? So if you have um, a building that people have abandoned for you. Um, you want as build drawings, of course, we we'll put a team in, in there, but there's it, 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 no way it won't cost you money. That money, didn't be, that money did not pay the contractor that time. You have to pay to consultants at some point to generate it for you. Because if you say, okay, there was one client that had to pay $2 million to get as build drawings. And this client was like, oh, it's expensive, blah, 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 right? It's expensive. What's the alternative? You can't pay $2 million now, but you are paying more than $2 million every month for different activities because you don't have the data on taking decisions around those activities. Well, that's the reality we face. So what if the contract, no variation was done, so he, he's 
let me tell you that as built is the same as oh that's design. simple that's simple you just take the original design and go and do measurement to validate then you change the okay. label yes that's all okay yeah then the last question like if you have an estate let me say you're building an estate that you have like 50 buildings mm -hmm. and the um the contractor has built he wants to hand over you've tested and then um, you've commissioned some because people have moved in mm -hmm. and there are still some that people have not moved in so the contractor is going to hang on to a handover till people move into those buildings before you commission and do proper uh, complete okay handover. no you 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 can do handover mm -hmm. and adopt a continuous commissioning or retro commissioning approach not all commissioning can be done at the onset okay and um, we have done uh, power commissioning by using a load bank for example you go and bring a, a bank of resistors and you plug it to the gen to simulate load in, impact on the generator so you can know whether the gen can take the load rating right so that simulated um, um, uh, commission i cannot commission the gen by using a load bank right otherwise i cannot afford the millions to go and get a load bank transporting it is very heavy and plugging it and taking it back I can decide to say commissioning is suspended till the building is populated. So every time we load it to a certain percentage, as I'm reading the meters, meter reading of the generators uh, low, uh, 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 production, I'll be recording the generator's performance against various load capacities until it reaches the peak it was designed for and see whether you can do it. So basically, we call that continuous commissioning where you are gathering data, commissioning data on an ongoing basis as space is being occupied. Then we also have the retro commissioning, which is something you do uh, at the point where a facility is now old enough for a renovation or overhaul or a major change, where you now do that upgrade and you record the difference in performance now versus before you did the upgrade. That's a retro commissioning. So commissioning does not need to be automatic at the beginning, but don't document it as commissioning when you do not do commissioning. Leave it blank, but it's not done. So if a if a a, a contract is not completely um, commissioned and handed over, is is regarded as still open, not closed. Well, the project can be handed over, right? Uh, even a contract can be closed without all the commissioning done. A, a, a commissioning commissioning aspects for projects most of the time they will lock it to the mechanical equipment they won't lock it they won't lock in the the structural and the uh, uh, architectural features into commissioning requirements but of course every time you are starting out you have a minimum expectation of these and these must be commissioned before we can close the contract there are some things that may not be commissioned, but that needs to be provided for in the contract from the onset. And then because you are going to have a different liability period where you hold the retainer's amount, a retention amount of the contractor's money, for example, there is that expectation that you will do commissioning during that period so that you can release that money at the end of the period and close the contract afterwards. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. If you had a good time, see you again. When Sorry, I sir. Uh, I, I just have this uh, question, sir. When the building um, is, is uh, newly constructed before yep. the final handover, maybe when you are doing the, um, the testing, yep. um, and then you need to do a kind of load testing to yep. check um, the life load. Mm -hmm. uh, that the building can carry. Mm -hmm. Do is, is how is the building loaded? How, let me ask. How is the testing carry out? Um, uh, it, it, check that maybe a bridge now, for example, uh, uh, like the Tom Milan Bridge is just being constructed. Then you uh, need to test the capacity. Oh, there, there, there are there are there are equipments for that. Um, um, structural engineers have equipment for that. They have uh, equipment that are based on echoes. They will sound. They will sound the true sound that the at the uh, uh, structure. Uh, yes, they will get a reverberation back of that sound, and they will the equipment to do some measurement on the strength and holding capacity. Um, 
uh, the other non-destructive non tests that they do, you know, that, you know, the BT gets a sense of what it can take in terms of resistance in, in um, uh, forces and, and so on and so forth. Yes, they do all those tests for sure. There are complex equipment for ensuring structural tests are done. Before I moved into the house I moved into recently, I called those guys in, they came in, they tested every pillars, columns and all that, gave me a report that was very comprehensive and, you know, it's, it's straightforward. Uh, of course, that's what they do. And then what, what we saw is to ask the question, what, what was their cost like? Uh, professional services, is, 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 it varies, you know, because uh, I'm using my professional network. I paid just about 200,000 naira, right? But if um, I'm going to provide that service for a company today, uh, for example, I will not take, I will not take 200,000 naira. I don't, I don't understand that. Okay, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.